Hello, everybody. DeVore Church here. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about love in the last days, but let's pray. Father God, as we come before you right now, we just praise you and we thank you for the love that you have for us. We thank you, Father, that the love is, is in, in our hearts, Father God, and, and that you put it there and, as long, and we accept it, Father, and we just want to give it back to you, Father God. So thank you as, you as you be with us, as you're with us tonight, Father. We ask your blessings on those that are watching online, for those that are here in the sanctuary, Father. We praise you for that. So, Father, guide us, direct us in our thoughts, guide us in my words, Father God, and we just want to tell you we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight, I was just looking to see who was coming in. <laughs> Tonight, uh, First of all, I just want to say that the lesson we're talking about, Love in the Last Days, I got most of this material from our wonderful friend that has passed on from us, Danny Isom. And uh, as I was looking for material for this, I came across one of his studies on it. And so I started using it and going into it. And you know, I got so much out of this t in studying this. I know love is good and and, I, and I, I know that Jesus and the disciples speak often of it. But tonight, as we, we're going to study it more in depth a little bit, we're going to talk about the, uh, the love that we need to have. I, I call it loving the unlovables. And that is a hard thing to do sometimes. It is for me, and I've had to repent many times in my life, especially my biblical life, my earlier life now. But my biblical life, I did. And it's awesome to, when you have that love in your heart for other people. Not saying that they don't try you. And not saying that the devil isn't there to poke, to poke you every now and then and say, you see that guy? He hates you. Yeah, but I love him. And that's hard. That is hard. So let's just start out here. Uh, we're going we're gonna to start out in John 13. Verse 34, I am giving you a new commandment that you love one another just as I loved you, that you also loved one another. I'm going to ask you tonight, if you can, to get a pen and paper. And I'm going to give you a lot of text tonight talking about love. And I'd like for you to write the, the text down, the numbers of the book, not necessarily the, the text itself because it's, some of them are very long. But after this, in the next few days, I want you to go back and and study that text. Look at it and read it over again till it's in your heart, till you understand it. It's a little, it was a little hard understanding for me. You would think that love is, is uncomplicated, and it is, but some of the stuff is a little, was a little hard for me to grasp on. But if you read, the, if you read the, uh, the text that I'll be giving out today and really earnestly praying over them, I think, you'll, I think we'll be okay. Okay, here we, the, the text we just wrote... I'm giving, you a new, I'm giving you a new commandment that you love one another just as I loved you, that you also love one another, John 13, 34. Yeah, this is a commandment, is something God has specifically given us as a responsibility that we must maintain in order to live in a covenant relationship with him. In the Old Testament, a covenant relationship not only meant keeping the core Ten Commandments initially given by the hand of God himself, but Jewish scholars will quickly point out that the Torah actually contains 613 commandments which must all be maintained. You must all practice them. Can you imagine practicing keeping 613 commandments? I had a hard time with 10. And so I, I, I understand why the commandment is love that will encompass so much of this. Jesus summarized, Jesus summarized them all as loving God with all one's heart and loving one's neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Matthew twenty two, forty. 40. So 
So now, how do we know for sure that Jesus was not merely giving us commandment number 614? Because from this point on, no one ever quotes from the commandment of the first habit regarding love. They only quote this new commandment as a fulfillment of the whole law. James, at the beginning on the first century church, said, if however you are filling the royal... Now, let me start over again. If however you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as thyself, you are doing well. James 2, 8. If I stumble a little bit, I'm watching my back here. Remember, we had a bunch of bees in here earlier today and for the Sunday service, for the Monday, night, Monday and Tuesday night Bible studies. Now, we got rid of them. But if you see me bolt and run, you'll know there's still one on me. So anyway, I'm just teasing. We got rid of most of them. But, but anyway, in this uh, scripture from, from, uh, from James, if however you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. James never quotes from the first tablet our contractual relationship with God. He only quotes from the second tablet about our relationship with others. In Galatians, I'll give you a scripture there in just a minute. Galatians is most likely the first epistle written by, jo by Paul. What did he have to say about the, at the onset of his ministry? Galatians 5.14, For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This might sound a little redundant we're going over, but it's going to catch up with it a little bit later. So that's why I'm giving you the text now to save and go back over. Again, Paul never quotes from the first tablet, only the second. Years later, at the height of Paul's ministry, he writes to the Romans in Romans 13, 8 through 10. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For the one who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And, there, and if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in the saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is fulfillment of the law. The fulfillment of the entire law is found in Christ's summary in the second tablet, to love others. At the end of the first century church, when all the apostles have gone to be with the Lord except John, the apostle of love, because this was the overwhelming focus of his teachings, what was the message preached by John in his own ministry and life? John 3.10, 3.11. And this is very important. First John, I'm sorry, First John 3, 10 through 11. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother or sister. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we are, love to, that we are to love one another. I know you say, people say, maybe not, not you, Oh, I, I love, I love my wife, I love my mom, my dad, I love my kids, I, I love uh, whatever. But is that done from pure love from your heart? Is that just a saying you're throwing out? Sure, you feel good when you're around your family. You're, you love to be around your family. Carol and I do too. We, we got a big family. They can irritate the heck out of us, but we feel good around them and we love them all. But it's easier to say love. I love you. I love you and not really know the meaning of it, or not really be willing to do what that commitment means, especially when it becomes, I love the Lord. I, yeah, I love the Lord. I love Jesus. What does it really mean? Second John 1, verse 6, And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you are to walk in it. We are to walk in love. Again, 
I walk in love. Sure. You know, I love a lot of things. I love chocolate. I love ice cream. But so we use that word kind of loosely sometimes. So what we're, what we're getting toward here, remember the title is Love in the Last Days. And so hang on in here. Again, no one quotes from the first uh, tablet. The proof that you are in the New Testament covenant relationship with Christ, the proof that you do indeed love God, is proven by your love for others. Aha, here we go. You cannot love God if you do not love others. Again, love the unlovable. You know, I'm sure we've all read so many times about they said if a homeless person, stinky and smelly, and I guess that's the same word, stinky, beard, <laughs> dirty, walks into your church and sits down beside you, what do you do? Do you greet them? Or do you sniff and move? I remember being in Palm Springs one time, and years and years ago, this homeless guy that I had seen on the streets quite often, even in San Bernardino, walked into the restaurant, and the pungent smell that he brought in engulfed the whole restaurant. And he wanted to say, why don't you guys get him out of here? I wasn't a Christian then. And I, I said, man, what? And so they set him way in the back where no other people. You could still smell. You could still smell. It curled your hair, and I got no hair. So that was amazing. But anyway, how do you love somebody like that? How do you love that person that walks in? How do you love that person that murdered somebody? God commands us to. And it's our heart. If your heart isn't right, you're not going to. This teaching is so important and is central to what is true, what is the true body of Christ. It, you are held accountable for in the shadow of the last days, you are held. Oh, let me read that again. This teaching is so important and is central to what the true body of Christ is held accountable in the shadow of the last days. What is important under normal circumstances has become even more important and amplified in priority as the intensity of the birth pains of these final hours increase in both frequency and strength. I'm sure if you turn on the news right now, if you flipped out of this study and you turn on the news, you're going to see some violence. Probably every, every station, probably almost every news article is going to be violent. Uh, you're going to see hatred. You're going to see that uh, they, they hate Christians. They hate anyone that will walk through there. Hate has run over the world now. And Satan is laughing. Satan isn't crying. He isn't saying, oh, woe is me. The birth pains have started, and they started a long time ago. This is how Jesus ends the Olivet Discord course, where he tells his followers what they are to do when they see all things prophetic coming to fulfillment. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him. Then he will sit on the glorious throne, and all nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another, just as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Now, I found this interesting, but I'm not going to go into that. He put the sheep on the right, on his right, and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you as a stranger and invited you in, or naked and clothed you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? Let me tell you, that was, that's Matthew 25, 31 to 46. 
And the king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it for one of these least, for one of these least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did it for me. Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, you accursed people, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves will also answer, Lord, when did you we see you hungry or thirsty, or as a stranger or naked or sick or in prison? And did not take care of you. And he will answer them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it for the one of these least, the least of these, you did not do it for me either. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Now that's that's rough. We've all been there, I think, that, uh, and, and, and maybe I have in both of them. But after I become saved, after I become with the Lord, I took a bigger look around, a large look around, and, and I still at times would, would feel something that wasn't godly in my heart for somebody that upset me, somebody that, uh, whether rich or poor, the rich are just as bad as the poor, the homeless, so we can't say that it's just one or the other. I can remember several times in my young life as a Christian, not liking what I saw, not liking what I heard. It offended me of somebody, even though maybe it shouldn't have offended me. So the criteria Jesus uses for separating the sheep and the goats all refer to the second tablet, and it refers to love. There's so many times that we're out on the streets, we're at a store, we're at a shopping mall, we're at a theater, we're at a, at a football, baseball, basketball game, and for somebody upsets us, and we shout obscenities at them, we do other things to curse them kind of in a way, and we've, we've, heard, we've heard people shout, I hate you! for no other reason than just to say that, because it wasn't going according to their will, their way. Look at the poor referees on a, in a ball game. They, those poor guys get hollered at all the time just for being human, whatever it is. What is the most important in the course of everyday Christianity? What, what is the most important in the course of uh, everyday humanity becomes even more important in the last days. They are separated based not on keeping the first tablet, but the second tablet. Let me get this right. Let me do say it again. They are separated based on keeping the first tablet, but the second tablet by equality, by the quality and their biblical love for others. Biblical love, love in the last days. John 13, 34, it becomes even more important. It says, I am giving you a new commandment that you love one another just as I loved you, that you also love one another. Do we teach that to our children? Do we teach that to our relatives, our mom, our dad that are older folks? You know, Carol and I, before the COVID, had a nursing home we went to and gave the Bible study on Fridays. So consequently, we'd be invited to some of the gatherings there that they would have like birthday parties or even in the fall and stuff like this for parties and little banquets. We would sit there with the people that we knew in there and, and talking and trying to, and not trying, but being very loving to them. And we would see the ones standing over by the door alone, and we'd go over and talk to them. And they would say, oh, my, my daughter, my daughter said she was coming. She's going to be here any minute. 
the end of the event, the woman was still the man. They were still standing at the front door. There was no love. Love in the word, love in your own word. Make your yes a yes and your no a no. But the love hurts the heart of those that uh, are being persecuted like that. I still can see these uh, older people in the nursing home standing there. No one to visit them. But yeah, mom, we'll be there. Don't worry about it. And then that's the last they say. Matthew 24, verse 12 and 13. And because lawlessness has increased, most people's love will become cold. But the one who endures to the end is the one who will be saved. Again, if we need an example of lawlessness, turn on your news. It doesn't have to be the, the big news. It can be an independent channel. They're still going to show all the lawlessness that goes on. And so many people will say, well, they're not really rioting. They're not tearing up things. They're not violent. They're just protesting nicely. During the COVID riots, we watched uh, a lot of it on Portland because we were up in the Oregon area at that time visiting. And I couldn't believe the violence, the lawlessness, the disregard for people, the disregard for any kind of love except for themselves. What is in it for me? What is in it for me? How many times have we heard that? Well, what's in it for me? Would you help me move? Well, what's in it for me? Would you do this or do that? What's in it for me? And they know what's in it for them, only them. People are so selfish, in the, and it's becoming more and more apparent in the last days. The lawlessness is increased, and most people's love will become cold. We need to encourage and inspire Christians to love one another by personally addressing the needs of others and actually the substance of God's end times economy. Now, I've never heard that said before, God's end times economy. We all, most of us, I, I know there's a lot of people watching that weren't, but some of us grew up in the U.S. and we got spoiled. What's in it for me? They gave you subsidies from the government. What else is in it for me? That's not very much. I remember then the COVID times, which wasn't very long ago. They were giving out all those stimulus checks. Our daughter, one of our daughters works in a, a place where they cash checks and they also sell food, but they cash a lot of checks back then. And some of these people who never worked a day in their life, apparently, and I never uh, came in with $30,000 card, debit cards that were stimulus. Now, I'm talking bad about people, and that's not right. But what I'm trying to say is they, the love of others is growing cold. We need to love those people, yes. I saw you come in with a chunk of money. That's great. May, may you be blessed by it. May God bless you with it but not, and not be upset with them. But the lawlessness has increased, and people's love will become cold. God's end times economy. We would not be able to pass any opportunity to, to show the love of Christ at a time when it is needed, needed more now than ever. Yes, it is. In our, in our classes that uh, Pastor Marco is teaching here about evangelism, you have to have love with evangelism. You can't go out and shout, and I've seen people do this, at the pregnancy centers and at all at homeless camps, they shout and condemn those. You need to love on them. Pity them, not pity. No, that's the wrong word. I'm sorry. We need to love them. We need to give them, show them the love that we have. What can we help you with anything? I've heard the, the re, yeah, the recipients of that cuss you out too. Some of the guys here, and I go to the raves here and the and the uh, the, the music festivals that are just downright Satanism. And they'll have urine thrown on them. They'll have just vulgar, vulgar words. How do you love those? Because God commanded us to. And you have to love them with your heart. You can't just love them superficially. Oh, I love them, but, 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 no. 
You have to genuinely love them. You have to walk up to them, and if they will let you, and this is an extremism, that if they'll let you, put your arm around them and say, I love you. What can I do for you? Now, some of them are going to say, well, I need this, this, and this, and this. You don't have to do that, but you do have to love them. You do have to try to help them. You do need to give them food when they're hungry. You do need to give them clothing when they're cold and without any. Remember when it was in somewhere, and I'm not sure where it's at, or even if it's just maybe a saying that, uh, I, know, I know it's in the Bible. Give them your own coat. Give them your own jacket. Don't give them just your shoes. Give them your everything. And you have to. You have to give them love. Love is not something that sits on a shelf and waits for you to come and get it. Love is something that you have to project from your body. You have to project from your mind and your soul and really mean it. I go back to the ones that say, well, I love my kids, but do you love your neighbor's kids? Well, you know, I mean, that's, that's not a good word probably to say nowadays, but do you love your neighbor? Love your neighbor as yourself. Again, we need to encourage and inspire Christians to love one another by personally addressing the needs of others and actually the substance of God's end, and this is actually the substance of God's end times economy. Love one another. We would not be able to pass any opportunity to show the love of Christ at a time when it is needed even more than ever. Yes, it is. Again, turn on your TV and look at the news. So how is this possible? First, we need to recognize the priority established in God's word. How can I realistically accomplish this? The answer begins in a single verse. 1 Timothy 1 to 5. But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and a sincere faith. The goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Love is not one of the gifts of the Spirit, are derived from the same kind of supernatural experience of impartation. It becomes, it, it but, become, but comes about by the simultaneous, simultaneously and an integrated work of a pure heart, good conscience, and sincere faith. Now let's get into that a little bit more. Overall, this is speaking of a deep and personal change of behavior of heart, mind, and soul. Looking at the list, it doesn't appear to be completely unre unreachable as they are actually familiar attributes spoken in Scripture. Each of these qualities is actually achieved in and of themselves by the proper application of God's word. Pure heart, biblically defined as a heart unpolluted by sin. Okay? A good conscience is a result of applying God's word to our mind and the very process by which we evaluate and decide Will I do it my way or God's way? Will I do it what the word says in spite of all the way I or the world would do it? See, that's the trouble. We're, we're all into the world. We're all in, again, I'm going to go back. We're all into self. Self, self, self. What's in it for me? What's in it for you? Eternal salvation, if you really want to know the answer. What's in it if you don't? Eternal damnation, if you, again, really want to know the answer. What's in it for me? Will I do what the word says in spite of, the, of that way? Or will, or will I do what the world would do? I would say right now that the biggest part of the world is doing what the world would do, especially in the West. We are so spoiled that I'm surprised that we're all still here. A lot of times in the, in the days when 
God was going to zap a nation, Sodom and Gomorrah, several others. Prophets would plead for him, and he would say, yeah, you find me one good one, I'll let him go. Never was able to find him. I think that's coming our way. I think that's coming our way not only in America, but in the Western world at least. We are not seeing good things happening worldwide. We are seeing the end times come right before us, before our eyes. We're seeing a time that we need to get out there and love people and tell people, tell them about the word because you, if you love them, you don't want them to go to hell. I don't care how bad they are. So we have to get love back in our hearts. We have to be there and approach this as God would approach it, as Jesus would approach it. I mean, uh, back in Matthew, I forget where it's actually at. Yeah, uh, it talks about, I think it's Matthew 9. The Pharisees saw Jesus having lunch, a meal anyway, with sinners and tax collectors. And they said, they told the disciples, look, look what you're, you're Guys, you guys doing? You're, you're Jesus. And Jesus overheard them, and he said to them, I did not come to heal the sick. I come to heal the sinner. And that's what love will do. Love will overtake anything. And we've heard this not only biblically, but we've heard people quote it. Love will overcome anything. If there was love in a family the kids wouldn't be raised like they are. Give them something to play with and, and, and a game of violence or whatever so I don't have to worry with them. I don't have to, and we talked about this last time in uh, Amos. Give them something. Don't take them, don't take them and say prayer to them while you put them down to sleep. Give them a game and say when this runs or whenever, you go to bed, go to sleep. They can't get up the next morning, but that's okay. Don't say prayer with them before they go to bed. Don't say grace at the table. That's not love. Love is doing this. Love is wanting your family, your friends, your strangers that you meet on the street every day to be in heaven with you. You say, well, some people would say, it doesn't matter. They're not going to change. It's not up to us. It's not up to us. We, we literally, none of us know what seeds we planted with love that made a difference. We have no idea. And if you get there in heaven, and I'm not saying you won't, I'm just saying you're going to see that. Somebody's going to come up to you and say, hi, Mr. Rick, hi, Mr. Scott, Miss Rebecca. You don't remember me, do you? But you did this for me. You gave me this. You gave me a jacket when it was cold outside. You gave me a hamburger from in and out you, did, you, you gave me a Christmas toy. And you're going, I didn't know that. Oh, praise the Lord. Thank you so much. That really turned my life around. There was, I was here waiting on the exterminators to, do the, take, to take care of the bees today. I didn't like that, but I mean, I didn't like getting rid of them that way, but that was the only alternative. And I was, I was sitting in the office and I saw, happened to look at the cameras and there was a red car had drove up and was sitting in the parking lot. So I went out, and I'm looking, where, what, where's these people at? I see two women over here under one of our trees they're eating an apple, older women, you know, Scott's age. And, uh, and uh, they were eating an apple. So I walked over and said hi and started talking to them and asked them where they were from. They were sisters. One was from Portland, Oregon, and one was from San Diego. And they were on their way to Mojave, Narrow, Mojave something, not Narrow, Mojave Valley to visit their brother, before he died, and he was to, they thought he was going to die this week. Okay. And we got to talking, and I said, well, you know, you can go around, and we've got a covered patio you're welcome to sit on. We've got restrooms inside. And they were, they were really, really, you, that's okay? Yes, it is. So they did that. And as they were getting ready to leave, they came in the door, and I was, I was sitting in here. I let them, let them be alone. And they said, you know, coming here, Oh, I know what she said. We came here because there's no parks, and we saw a few trees we could get under. And she said, coming here today and meeting you guys is, is the most greatest thing of our journey, to see our brother. 
So I asked them if they were Christians, if they were believers, they yes. And I asked if their brother was, yes. And while they had been sitting outside, I put a text out to the guys on the thread, and I said, please pray for this young man. He's only in his 60s, 64, I think. Please pray him. He's, he's, he's dying of cancer. Keep him in your prayers. And so immediately some of them answered back. And so when the women came in, I said, you know, I've already had answers from, from people across the world, one in particular from Australia, that are praying for your brother. And they felt so overwhelmed. I'm not saying it was me because it wasn't me. It was God. But they were feeling so overwhelmed because somebody, it could have been anybody. It could have been Margie, Carol, Rick, Scott, Rebecca, anybody could have done that because it was done for them. And it was done, I knew they were hurting. They had to be hurting. Prayed for them, let them go on their way. But that's what we're talking about here. Love. Your, love your neighbor as yourself. Never seen him, never will again, probably. We'll, hopefully, I'll see him in heaven. Hopefully, we'll see the brother Richard there. I'm hoping that God heals him at 64 years old. He, it started out with a little mole, and boom, turned into cancer. Why? Because the devil rules on earth with a sin. How many times have you talked to somebody that you could tell was down and out, not feeling good, not, not, uh, not having a good day. And you ask them, can I pray for you? Yes, you can. And you pray for them, and they feel a lot better, but they have also understand the, the, the prayer of love. Today, a, a mother called me and asked me to pray for her son back in the, in the east, Said, I, here's his number. I don't know if he'll talk to with you, but please call him. I called him and I said, This is, he said, Who's this? And I said, well, This is Roy. I'm from California. How did you get my number? I said, Well, your, your mother and I are friends with me and Carol. And uh, I just want to call. I heard you weren't having a very good day. And he, I don't feel like talking right now. Well, at least let me pray for you. Now, where that goes, I don't know. He let me pray for him. He let me talk with him. He let me give him a word, of, a word of my own journey through this. I don't know. He's, he's not got a good uh, track record, I can tell you that. But who knows? It's not up to me. It's not up to you. It's up to giving love to the people, to the stranger. You gave me, you gave me love when you didn't know me. We've all been there. A lot of times, we've already talked about this a little bit, we, it's selective love. I will love you, you, and you, but not you. I don't like you. As Scott Grenville go, you stink. You smell. I don't, I don't like you, but, I, but if you insist, here, here's a dollar, go buy yourself a taco, Whatever. And that's not, that's not biblical love. That's not love in the last days. Love in the last days is to help us assure people that there is a God and that they will get there if they read his word and love his word, if they love him and pray to him. Pray to him like he is your father because he is. Pray to him like he's your only hope because he is. Nobody's going to get you in there but him. Our Lord Jesus told us many times. We can never find true biblical love where there is a total vacuum of God's word. Mm -hmm. But now we see why we don't just read God's word and why we don't simply study it instead of meditate on it, incorporating into our prayer life. You know, that's always been a big uh, concern of mine for people that they, they, they want help, they want prayer, people do. And you're trying to help them, but they won't read the word. They don't have the biblical uh, love of going through the Bible. When our, Carol and I, uh, when we came to DeVore about 10, 11 years ago, it was because Danny Ison made us come. He kept saying, you got to go see Marco. you got to go see Marco. 
And bless his heart, Marco is, so loves his people that every time after church, you couldn't get close to him. And still today, you, you, you have a hard time because he wants to talk to everybody. He wants to love upon everybody. Finally, after the fourth time of coming, we finally did. And so we got involved with uh, Danny's Bible study. Jacob was taught it a few times too. We love Jacob. I just had a blank for all. It'll come back to me in a minute. When you get my age, there's a lot of blanks. You just hope they aren't too far between. Uh, uh, in this Bible study, and, and Brother Danny passed away last July, almost a year ago. But we would go through the Bible approximately every three years. The first time we went through the Bible, we understood stuff, we got stuff, we gleamed it. The second time we went through it, we got more. We're on our third time now, uh, going through it, and we're about to finish it up in July, July or August. But you can't have a vacuum of God's Word. Every time we went through it, even this time, and the fourth time we go through it, we will find even more gems and we'll gleam it from it. That's the love of God if we have for God's Word. That's the love we have for our Lord and Savior Himself. That we want to know everything. And I'm telling you, and, 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 and I know here in the audience tonight, there's, a, I guess you call it congregation, several people that go to that study. And every week, every one of us will say, well, I didn't know that. I didn't understand that the first time around. God sends you those little hidden gems. But you have to love to do it. You have to love the unlovable. You have to love those that don't want to love you. It doesn't matter whether they want to love you or not. You have to love them. This is not about education. Ed, this is not about education knowledge, but the deepest arithmetic change, arithmetic, the deepest authentic change of behavior from our very heart, mind, and soul. Consider that if Christ's love cannot be found in the individual who ignores or outright abandons his word, how can it be possible to present in a local church, denomination, or movement which proclaim the priority of his word? Yeah, there's a lot of them out there. Trust me, Carol and I have been to them. You guys have heard my story too many times. I won't go back and repeat it. But there's a lot of them out there that uh, they won't ignore that. They don't want to, if they can't talk, they talk love, but they talk love of money in a silent way. They talk love, but they don't talk about loving the sheep. They talk about love. It's wholly different than how God talks about love. It's totally different from what Jesus has told us to love one another. It's a totally different program. Where they get it from? The enemy. What happens when anything is allowed to take its place? What kind of love is actually taking place? Even if they claim it in the name of Christ. And again, we have heard that. Hey, Carol and I have been around in our short time as being Christians, as many of you have too, especially out there on the line and in here. And there is so much talk about love that they don't even know what love is. Again, love to them is what is what's in it for me. What's in it for me? Not, not what can I do for the Lord? What can I do for you? What's in it for me? But even if the world is taught, it must still be followed through and, and applied so as to a change behavior. So even if we teach the world, and we love the world, the people in it, they have to have a changed behavior. You cannot, and how many times have we heard this? Oh, yeah, I believe that. Yeah, I understand it. Yeah, come on, let's all go out for a drink, celebrate. Or, I, I, I believe in the Lord. I love the Lord. I love Jesus. But there's a big ball game coming on. It doesn't matter what they say. We need to love them. We got to show them love. That's the only way. You can't, and that's a, that's a lifestyle. That's not a way of, of just saying that. It love, loving people and loving them correctly and loving them deeply 
and, in, and personal is a way of life. It's a way from your heart. It's not a way of, of uh, for, what, am I, what would I say, for those that uh, are lighthearted. It's not a way from those, for those genuine love. It's not a way for people just to come in and say, yeah, it's easy to do. I'll go out and love. To, let's all go out and evangelize. Okay, let's go. Well, 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 wait a minute. I'm not sure I can do that. If you genuinely love, if you genuinely love, genuinely love, you have no problem. This is one of the most powerful prophetic indicators that we have actually begun to experience the final sequence of the last days. Script defines the abandonment of God's word as lawlessness. And its main casualty where God, God's people are concerned is biblical love, resulting from the discarding of the standard of his word. Yeah, if you're not reading his word, you're not there. And I, like I say, you, people say, I, oh, I'm on this program. I can read God, the Bible in 30 days. No, yeah, you can read. Hey, I took a, a reading course uh, years ago where you learned to read a, the, whole thing, the whole book in just a few minutes. But it was looking at it and memorizing and going. I mean, it was totally different. You can't comprehend. You can't comprehend. We listen to Marco every Sunday, and it's awesome. But every time we hear him, we learn something different. We listen to Jacob. We listen to Danny for years. And we learn something different every time. We were listening, I think, to John Holler the other night, which we don't normally only because we don't really have always the time. And we learn something all the time. We listen to Anthony up here, our other elder, and Rick on teaching the men. And we learn something because why? We want to. We want to find the love in there that we can take to somebody else. Love, love, love. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will become cold. If you are not completely and totally obedient to his law, that is the whole word of God that has become your chosen substitute. If you are not being changed by God's word, what exactly do you think is going on? What's going on? You're not listening, you're not studying, you're not going, and you're not praying. If you don't read the word and pray, why be a Christian? If you don't love the Lord, if you don't love people, if you don't want to help people, why are you a Christian? There's a lot of good people that don't profess to be Christians, but that's not what you want to be. You want to profess and help people. I think it's been, I don't know how long ago, but not very long ago, I had a, and, I, and I'm going to tell you the truth, I don't know if this was my thoughts or if I found it somewhere else, I'm going to read a thing here, but it's something that is awesome that I, in my life, in my eyes, and it means a lot, it says, there is coming a great gathering of the saints. The gathering will not be in a church building or a big conference center or in a sports arena. It'll be at the hearts of those who love him, those who are not fearful to shout his name on high, those who will love the unlovable and tell them of our answer of our awesome Lord, Jesus Christ. And in the end it says, have you reserved your ticket for this event? There's a time coming not near away, not near out of the future. when we will be accountable for what we do, what we didn't do, mainly. There's going to be a time when we will, some will be asked, what did you do? Did you feed me? Did you clothe me? Did you help me when I was sick? Did you come and visit me? And it, what will you say? Hopefully you'll say, yes, I did. And hopefully he will too and say, yes, you did. You did it to others. And not just me, but you did it to those that love you or love me. And that was all that I was asking you to do. That you love 
and help out of love to all those that you meet. There should not be a stranger in our midst. There really should not be. There should not be a unlovable in our midst, even though there are some that are, make it pretty hard. We should be able to walk up to anybody and not just say, God bless you. Anybody can do that, and then we should, but not just say, good God bless you and walk away. God bless you. Is there anything I can, that I can help you with today? Can I help you mow the yard? You know, can I help you carry your groceries in? Can I pay for your groceries in front of me? I see you're struggling. Can I help you whatever it is? Can I help you read the word? Can I pray for you? Can I help you understand you have any questions? If you do read the Bible, what about anything? Can I help you? Can I help you? God loves you. Now we can. God loves you. You have any questions on his love? We can't be bashful, but we can't be boastful. Oh, I helped this person today. And I don't, and I, I really, when I tell stories of things that happened, uh, maybe today or yesterday, I tell it as a training example and not on my uh, building myself up. Years ago, I had a very humbling experience with the Lord. When I first came to the Lord, and I've told you guys probably many times, he said, I'm going to use you in Carol, but you're never going to get any credit for it. Well, that kind of upset me. But then he touched my heart, and I said, thank you, Lord. And now it doesn't matter. Sure, I'm sure I slip now and then. Well, why didn't I get credit for that? No, that's not what we're here for. You'll get credit one day elsewhere. You'll get credit when the time comes, and he says, what did you do for me? I, what did you do to tell others about me? What did you do to help those that were unfortunate? Yeah. We're very fortunate here at DeVore. We have an awesome pastor that loves to help people. We have an awesome pastor that uh, loves his people, loves his sheep. And we have an awesome group that go here. We have an awesome group that listen online. You're always wanting to know more. But remember in this that love, love, love. Love, if you even look at the first uh, set of uh, the first tablet, love your Lord God. Do not commit adultery. Well, yeah, if you're married and you love your wife, you're not going to commit adultery. Do not covet. Yeah, if you if you uh, think you want to covet uh that's not love. Your your neighbor, if you, this so everything in there it goes back that you would not do if you had love in your heart for that person. So tonight I, I know it's uh, it's probably only about an hour. I'm sorry. I don't speak too long. I just want to tell you that uh, go over these go over these uh, scriptures and don't make it selective love. Make it genuine love. It's easy to do selective love. Have a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. Unpolluted heart by sin. Your heart is unpolluted by sin. A good conscience, result of applying God's word to our mind. Sincere faith, anyone who is sincerely faithful. In other words, the steadfast journey of the soul is never to never stray from God's path. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you tonight as we, as we wrap up our teaching, Father God. And I thank you that you put this in, in the Bible for us about, about love, Father. And I thank you that that means all. That's all the commandments is love. And we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you were teaching that to your disciples. And, and God had them put it down in the word for us to read and for us to come to and remember that we love. We don't hate. We love. And we love the unlovable, Father God. No matter what other people may say, we need to always see the good and and love in in the best of them and the worst of them. If the the guy comes in and he doesn't smell quite right, love upon him anyway. I'm not afraid to hug him. Jesus wasn't afraid to hug him. You shouldn't be afraid to hug him. 
our government now, that might be another thing. But Father God, we praise you and ask you to be with us and guide us as your children. We thank you, Father, that you're there with us. We thank you that you take care of us. And we, Father, we pray for our great nation that, that it will come to you, Father. And we pray blessings upon everyone that's in it. In the precious name of Jesus, amen.